All right, very good. Welcome to the uh, Delenco Township Committee meeting on uh, October 19th, 2021. This is being held via uh, Zoom remote access on the Zoom platform and normally held at the uh, municipal, build municipal building 770 Cooperstown Road in Delenco. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Brown is absent. Ms. Fitzpatrick? Here. Ms. Holland? Here. Mr. Olat? See me? Mr. Olat? I see him waving. <laughs> He's muted. Does He's that count? Mr. Olat, you're muted. Uh oh, he's trying to. He's muted. Let me see if I can call him. I don't he know if he can hear us, I'm, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Mr. Templeton. And I'm here, yes. Uh, also present tonight, Mr. Schwab, Township Administrator. Uh, Mr. Heinholder, our Township Solicitor, Mrs. Gore, Municipal Clerk. Mrs. Martin, there you are. Uh, Deputy Municipal Clerk. Uh, Chief uh, just DeSanto, and we have Aaron Provenzano, our uh, information technology specialist. Uh, flag salute, please. I pledge allegiance it's to the flag, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic. the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, uh, indivisible, uh, with liberty uh, and justice uh, for all. For all. Thank you. Uh, Sunshine statement, please, Mrs. War. Please be advised that proper notice of this meeting has been given has been given in compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act in the following manner. Written notice has been mailed to the Burlington County Times and Courier Post and published in the January 5th, 2021 editions. And written notice has been posted on the official bulletin board of the Township of Delango at least 48 hours prior to the meeting. This meeting is also being held via a Zoom uh, remote platform. The meeting ID and passcode are printed on the agenda as well as available on the township website and on the bulletin board and front window. And remote public meeting uh, statement, um, advanced public comments will be accepted via written letter or electronic mail and must be received no later than six hours prior to the commencement of the published public meeting start time. Um, the members of the public who wish to make comments or have questions during the meeting, public comment sessions may or have their questions via audio option or by typing their comment or question via the Zoom platform chat option. Um, and the agenda for this meeting has been available on the Delanco Township website, delancotownship.com. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this evening we'll start off uh, um, with public input session on recreational cannabis uh, uses and uh, uh, the zoning and application on how that applies to municipalities across the state, specifically here in Delanco. Um, as you all know, uh, last November, the uh, um, ballot question was uh, approved by the voters of New Jersey and uh, legislation passed through the assembly and uh, the legislature in Trenton and was signed by the governor uh, following that. Um, as of now, there are still um, uh, the Cannabis uh, Regulatory Commission uh, was just established about three weeks ago or so. And so there are a lot of moving parts still in progress. Uh, but right now, uh, uh, there's a deadline of uh, August uh, 21st, I believe, for municipalities to determine um, what classes or categories of cannabis uh, marketing would be permitted in a municipality. And uh, there are some timelines that are set with that. Uh, we have to make a decision probably in the next month or so to for our own process uh, for the township committee uh, to uh, compose an ordinance. And then it, it goes to the joint land use board for review and then comes back to us uh, to meet those timelines, we need to make a decision, like I said, probably in the next month or so. So I'll pass this on to um, our solicitor, Mr. Heinhold, and he can go into the legalese and details of what we're talking about. As far as the public comment, uh, I think uh, just to start out, maybe try to uh, 
put a bracket on this of about 45 minutes or so. If we've got more participants and more varying ideas that are being presented to the committee for our consideration, we'll extend that. That's not a hard limit. But uh, just as a, as a start, wanted to put kind of a, uh, an end time on it. Uh, following that, uh, the committee will have a discussion and, and uh, uh, bring in some of the other administration uh, with the municipality, uh, uh, the chief and Mrs. Lohr and, uh, and Mr. Schwab on their uh, comments as far as the process uh, to add to Mr. Heinhold's uh, dissertation. So uh, I'll... Be quiet now and let Mr. Heinhold take it from here. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so as discussed the, in November, the, the ballot measure passed. Um, and then the state legislature, after a lot of trial and tribulation, finally uh, in February passed the statute that is going to govern uh, this issue and really the the issue before the committee there's there's parts to the legislation uh, some of which are entirely governed by the state side and really have nothing to do with uh, township control uh, so the, the issue before the governing body and the town as a whole is whether to permit uh, any of the use classifications that are outlined in the statute within the municipality. And there are six of them. The first one is a cultivator license. The second is a manufacturer. Third is wholesaler. Fourth, distributor. Fifth, retailer. And sixth, delivery. Uh, the, the municipality specifically has control to permit or prohibit any of those classifications within the township, except for class six, which is the delivery aspect. Um, municipalities are preempted by the statute. The, the state has said that delivery needs to be permitted in all municipalities. So that drops us down to basically from a grow facility inception all the way to point of sale uh, retail and and the you know the various breakdowns in between so in terms of our existing zoning if we do nothing and 180 days passes we are essentially um, under the law the way it operates we would be permitting uh, grow, cultivation, manufacture, manufacturing, selling, and selling in uh, our industrial zones and then retail within our existing retail zones. And there are some parameters to that that we would have to get into, but essentially if a municipality sort of just turns a blind eye and doesn't do anything, they essentially default into the program. Uh, the other option is to say we're going to permit uses class one, two, and three in the industrial zone or do an overlay and create specific areas where we permit that. Uh, we could do class five retail, uh, again, in our retail zone or commercial zone or, again, create an overlay zone associated with that. Um, so the, the, that's essentially the overview of what the town is looking at. If we opt in, meaning we take an affirmative measure to participate or we fail to act within 180 days, we, we are locked in for five years. So whatever affirmative step we say, we're going to be in the program. And I think the thinking behind that is, is that once you put your zoning in place, they want the, the other side of the table, the business community to be able to, to rely upon that and move forward. Um, so, so there is a lock in element to this that you, you, once, once you sort of say, yes, we're in, you're, you're in for five years. You can revisit that after five years, but if somebody has already become a licensed facility, they're protected and they don't get uh, they don't get removed after those five years if you've changed your mind. The other option is um, 
what's basically the opt out provision. And that basically is a, we're not going to permit anything, uh, any of these uses in, in any zone at time. Now, if you opt out, Originally, I think the way the legislation read, you, you opted out also for five years. That seems to have been revised so that we can now opt out initially. And then if, as we grow uh, more aware or other opportunities present themselves, we can reconsider and then decide at some later date to opt in. Um, which again, I think is an interesting development because it would provide some flexibility if we start to see a track record for these uses um, or a specific user comes to Delanco and says, here's what I propose and it's amenable to the township, something could be crafted around that. Uh, so th that's kind of the, the overview uh, of what, um, what is happening at the state level and the need for us to undertake the examination and make a decision about what path we wanna take. Okay, um, I guess we'll just open it up for questions. Uh, as you um, uh, make yourself uh, either raise your hand in the Zoom uh, platform or get our attention on the video, uh, we'll call on you, state your name, address, and uh, your point, uh, comment that you'd like to make, and so forth. And we'll try to work our way through and get as much. Uh, varied and diverse uh, views on this as, as possible. So let's see, Mr. Bartlett in the center of the Hollywood Squares. Good evening, Mayor Templeton. Uh, Matt Bartlett, 1800 2nd Street, Delanco. Uh, while I don't use marijuana, nor have I ever, nor do I welcome it in my home, I do not have an issue with people that choose to do so. I have friends that use medical marijuana due to various medical conditions. I fully support whatever person wishes to legally use. That being said, the township committee has to take action on this. It's simply not an option to allow the state legislature to determine what's acceptable in our community, what zoning ordinances uh, should be allowed as a permitted or conditional use. Uh, personally, I would not be in favor of the class five retailer being permitted uh, as a conditional use in our commercial zones. Uh, number one, as I understand it, uh, Riverside and Edgewater Park both have approvals for cannabis retailers on Scott Street, uh, Scott Street and Route 130. Um, number two, even though the legislation doesn't allow the police uh, to have uh, pretty much any power of enforcement or it's diluted, uh, I would expect that this is just a hunch that the police are still going to get numerous nuisance calls on the store and its patrons and activities surrounding the same. And to be clear, that's not about the patrons. Any purchases, of course, would be legal. It's just other people's perception of them. And my concern with this, it would already stress a police department that is already spread too thin. Uh, I would be in favor of the class one through four facilities in the industrial zone. And to be clear, only in the industrial two zone, not the industrial one zone, because the one zone is really close to residents. So, and the industrial one zone is the old Distributech facility up on Burlington Avenue by the uh, Head Start School and the Laurel Manufacturing Facility uh, by the Babe Ruth Field. Uh, I would be in favor of it in the I-2 zone as it's far away from the residents. Uh, if we were to allow a class one grow facility in doing research, it would use a lot of water. Uh, so we should absolutely involve the sewer authority from the get-go to confirm that the system could handle any water. And then if not any condition that any uh, applicant has for a, a grow facility in the industrial two zone uh, should be required to work with the sewer authority and reimburse them for anything that's required uh, for the um, any system modifications. And also if we do have a developer who wants to build any of those classes, under no circumstance, we should give them any pilot agreements for them. We can't continue to give away the proverbial uh, farm on this. Uh, they want to be here because it would be a permitted use. There's no need to keep enticing them by giving them pilot grants. Um, 
few weeks ago with all the information posted on the town's website, I posted a simple poll on the residents of Delanco Facebook page. Some of you may have seen it. Nothing scientific, just a simple multiple choice uh, option with the residents be in favor of allowing the class one through four in the industrial or the class five in the retail zone or nothing at all. Votes were 92 to allow the class one through four in industrial, 20 votes to allow in the retail and don't allow anything at 11 votes. Like I said, it's not scientific by any stretch of the imagination, just basically a straw poll to see what people are feeling. And lastly, um, you have other people waiting, my, and my main reason for supporting this is the tax that allows up to 2% by the township to charge or 1% for a wholesaler um, that the municipality would get. It could be a financial windfall for the municipality. That being said, and while I didn't fully read the 240 pages of legislation, but in the many pages I did read, I couldn't find anything that says how the money gets divvied up. Uh, the 2% that the town gets, or the 1% if it's a wholesaler, it should get fully uh, shared with the school system. That right here could solve a lot of problems with the school. Uh, the committee voted a few weeks ago during the budget discussions not to share the pilot, but found pilot money with the schools. Should the school, should the uh, committee choose to move forward with allowing cannabis in Delanco, this amount should be fully shared with the schools, no ifs, ands, or buts. Thank you very much. Thanks for the good comments. Let's see, I've got comment. someone labeled as Mary in the top yeah. corner there. Uh, Mary Tiscornia, I'm Barry Tiscornia, 510 Poplar Street. Did, hang on a sec, did you get the name, Mrs. Lohr? Um, is it Barry? Barry Tiscornia, T-I-S-C-O-R-N-I-A. Thank you, go ahead, sir. Your address again, I'm sorry, address? Five, 510 Poplar. Thank you so much. Sure. I just uh, wanted to find out, has there been any revenue projections as to the 2% uh, and 1% uh, if, if any of this is approved? You mean what, what the actual revenue stream could Pro be? Projected revenue, say, for, for a year. Uh, I have not seen anything. I don't uh, have no idea what it would be at the at the local level. Uh, obviously, it depends on what what would come in or what would be allowed uh, through this as a result of this uh, discussion and, and moving forward. But I've not seen any numbers, um, and I think there's there's just there's a lot of question on that. Yes, okay. but Thank you. we do not know. Uh, next, uh, let's see. I've got uh, Mr. Tarashi. There I see you. Mayor, um, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, printout talks of, that talks about cannabis consumption areas. I agree with much of what Mr. Bartlett has said. And should we end up with a retailer or medical dispensary in our municipality? Uh, it talks about how they can have a uh, consumption area on their premises. Now, for most of you, you understand that although I am on the joint land use board to which this eventually will be referred, I am not uh, representing anything of the board. This is only my current opinion before hearing other people speak of it. And that is in this consumption area, perhaps if it's allowed, we should have some regulation that talks about ventilation to allow the smoke that's generated to be expelled through some type of a processor before it's distributed into the general air so that other people walking <laughs> around are not breathing it. Um, and I'm also interested in hearing Chief DeSanto speak on whether or not there is potentially a problem with us being on the river line between Trenton and Camden. Trenton, by the way, is my birthplace. I was raised there. Camden is where I went to law school. Uh, so I am not degrading either uh, municipality. As but, a former teacher in Burlington City, I know many who took 
the river line. I taught them. <laughs> And it so, wasn't pleasant. So we're just wondering <laughs> if we will have an influx from people outside of the community. There. Um, those are my mm -hmm. comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge. Uh, I believe Mr. Martin. I don't think that's a problem. They will. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Daniel Martin, 628 Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, I'll repeat first what Carl immediately said before me. I'm not representing the uh, Joint Land Use Board. Uh, this is my own personal feelings on it. Uh, unlike Matt Bartlett, I will confess to smoking about 40 years ago. And that's about it. Uh, it did nothing for me, so I stopped. Um, I decided to, to participate in this meeting because of a comment that uh, Committeeman Brown, who unfortunately isn't here today, made at a prior meeting. And it sounded like I uh, was listening to stories from people walking into the store or walking around the town or a church, how they don't want marijuana. Uh, I would like to remind the committee that our township passed it by a margin of 73% to 27% to allow this. That's a very significant amount of people. Uh, I did a little bit of math. That's 50% of all registered voters, not only the people that voted. So there is a majority of people in this town that would like to see it. Um, I didn't get Barry's last name, but he was asking for uh, how much money would be uh, available. Uh, I, there was a report based in Oregon uh, Portland, Oregon, which is probably a community that's younger and maybe partakes a little bit more, uh, had an average sale of $378 per resident. Uh, assuming that everybody that voted in favor would be a person that would purchase this, that comes out to about $14,000 a year. I don't think the tax revenue is that significant. Uh, where it is significant is when you're on a border. Uh, Ontario, Oregon has about $2,800 $2, of cannabis sold per county resident because they're right next to Idaho. And they said about 70% of all their sales are to out-of-staters. So that, those are the things I had. Um, I would like to, again, the, the residents of our township have already spoken. That's the poll I heard. It was an election. And this was also during the presidential election. We had an excellent turnout. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and committee. I've got a comment. Thanks for uh, good comments, Mr. Martin. Appreciate it. Uh, let's see, Mr. McLaughlin. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Steve McLaughlin. I'm at 740 Rank Oakus Avenue. And uh, I'll, yeah, disclaimer, I'm speaking as a private citizen. Um, so for my part, I support uh, allowing um, all, all five classes of the, the cannabis business that are on the table here in Delanco. So I think that the township committee should do, uh, should do nothing. I think the first four classes uh, other than retail are pretty much no brainer. So I can't see the objection to those because as a town, we'll get to enjoy the tax revenue and um, it just doesn't seem to be a downside to me. Um, I think that as far as the, the retail issue, I think the misperception that a lot of people have is that a cannabis retail operation is going to be equivalent to a liquor store, and I just don't think that's true. From you know, from what I've seen in other states, um, it's just uh, it's more. It's a <laughs> essentially these businesses are pretty discreet. People are not going to be, you know, you're not going to have people going in five times a day, hanging out out front, um, most likely. Um, I think it's the kind of thing where people go in once a week. I mean, it's more like a. Um, I mean, it's a specialty store. It's not like a, a bar or a, um, uh, or a liquor store, at least in my opinion. So I think that it's, it's not gonna damage the, the, uh, the fabric of Delanco. And also I'll, I'll throw this in. I think it's great that Delanco is a dry town. I really appreciate that. It helps make us distinctive, um, but I think it's a separate issue from the cannabis. Um, also, I'll direct, I think anyone on this call who's interested in, in, in property values, in that angle, um, should look up a report that just came out this month from the National 
Association of Realtors, uh, which is called uh, Marijuana and Real Estate, a budding issue. And the, the findings were, it's a complicated document based on, um, on a survey of, of realtors around the US. Um, so I encourage you to check it out. But essentially the findings were neutral. I mean, uh, most realtors said there was not a change in property values. Uh, there actually were more, there were more realtors who said the property values went up uh, after cannabis was legalized um, than the, the opposite. So I just think that the, I think that the fears about um, changing the essence of Delanco are just overblown. Um, yeah, and I'll, and I'll end with that same number that Dan just mentioned, 73% uh, of Delanco residents already voted in favor of legalization. And it seems like, to, to me, I think the Township Committee should, should uh, reflect the wishes of Delanco residents in, in making this decision. So thank you very much. Thank you for the comments. And thank you for the reference to that report. I certainly look into it. Uh, let's see, I see a hand of Mrs. Uh, Darmo. Vera Darmo, 605 Hickory Street. Um, I don't, I think we should have the attitude of trying to not just advertise immediately and seeing, you know, who shows up. I think we need greater outreach on this issue. Um, I think we need to have people see maps because people aren't, I don't know where all the zoning areas are and I try to look it up and it was still confusing. I saw like the commercial area, I think next to the Rancocas Creek and Route 130 and I was thinking, how can that be a, a C3 area? Like, it's a little confusing. I think it would be good for residents to know what the zoning map looks like, know where, uh, possible areas for these licenses might come into effect and advertise like a, a town-wide pool that Mr. Bartlett did on a small scale, but try to have a greater outreach. Don't just say, okay, well, if you didn't come to the meeting, too bad. Like, let's, let's do greater outreach. And my second comment is um, when I was researching this, I found um, something that said that um, because cannabis is illegal at the federal level, it renders it effectively an all cash industry as the federally insured banking system um, is extremely limited on how it can service this, this industry. So that's just something that I was wondering, did, did that come up at all? If, if this is illegal at the federal level, is this going to be all cash payments for taxes and when, when they're paying their tax. So those are my comments. Thank you. Yes, the, uh, the actual um, currency exchange has been a question uh, at several levels, but uh, I don't believe that's been fully resolved. And there are several conflicts uh, and discontinuities between uh, what New Jersey has passed and what they're working towards and current federal uh, regulations. Uh, uh, current, uh, New Jersey through legislation had downgraded uh, cannabis uh, to enable this process, uh, yet uh, at the federal level, it is still a um, uh, chief, help me out here, a schedule, schedule one, schedule two. Uh, schedule one. Schedule one. Uh, the one local application of that is that uh, it would be legal within uh, a retail uh, operation, would be legal within a thousand feet of a school under state law, but illegal within a thousand feet of a school under federal law. Um, and so that would, uh, you know, uh, have implications here for uh, our, one of our commercial areas and one of our schools. So uh, there's a lot of things that need to be untangled here. Uh, and I'm looking oh around God, to see if my ear. Come here. any other comments or a hand raised or let me see if there's someone else and I'll come back to you. Uh, there, I've got a Mr. Abdil. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Rich Abdil. I'm at uh, 525 Buttonwood Street. Um, and I, I mostly called in today because I was curious what other people thought about all the different flavors of potential cannabis businesses um, that could come here. And I, I just wanted to, to quickly just challenge the idea that cannabis 
retail would be a harmful thing or that it's a foregone conclusion that it's a harmful thing. Um, I think in any other scenario, um, we're going to have people coming in from other towns to patronize our businesses, wouldn't be taking on an ominous tone. I think that'd be exciting, particularly for an industry with a special tax that can go toward whatever the town, the, the municipality needs to go toward. Um, and I, I think the implication is that is that cannabis users are going to hassle people, um, which, uh, you know, thinking like one of the other commenters uh, had mentioned about liquor stores um, makes sense. But I'm I'm not at least I'm not aware of any research showing that cannabis retailers increase crime um, in a kind of a, a local way, the way that liquor stores do. Um, a study in 2018 from the Institute of uh, Labor Economics found the opposite. Um, they found that crime dropped in neighborhoods that had cannabis dispensaries, um, even compared to neighborhoods that were right next door. Um, and there, I, I think the idea is that people selling cannabis on the black market are also committing other crimes. So legitimizing that market and giving people a place to go to do that legally or to, to purchase it legally means those, those people who were operating on the black market aren't around to commit larceny and assault and whatever else that they're doing. And I, I think even in, in addition to, to Delenco voting overwhelmingly in favor of legalization, I think a lot of issues that aren't about as politically charged an issue as cannabis focus a lot on how can we encourage people to come here? How can we improve our business district? How can we um, get more jobs in the area? And this seems like it could have the potential to do a lot of those things if we aren't just kind of suspicious of people who are purchasing legal cannabis just as like on principle. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Let's see, go back to, uh, I don't see, let's see, Mr. Tarashi again. My, uh, yeah, right. Thank you, Carl Taroski at 55 Pennington Court, Delanco. Um, a couple of questions uh, to uh, you, Mr. Mayor, and to uh, Mr. Heinold. Uh, do we know to what extent the tax, if we approve any of these uses, do we know to what extent the tax we raise from that would be offset from uh, benefits that the state gives us tax-wise or contributions to our tax base. The other comment I have is that we do seem to have a lot of uh, open field space for growing capacity. So uh, maybe a cultivator uh, might be something that we should consider. But more than that, I'm concerned about the tax offset. Is it offset from other benefits that we receive from the state? Thank you. I'm not aware on if uh, Mr. Heinhold, Mr. Schwab, or Mrs. Lohr have, have seen or heard anything. I'm not aware of any, any offset or decrease or increase in state funding as a result of uh, approval or disapproval of this. Uh, regarding uh, open uh, land agriculture purposes, uh, my understanding is that uh, any uh, grow operation would be in uh, uh, indoors hydroponic uh, uh, greenhouses and so forth um, uh, under artificial lighting 24 seven. So that's my understanding of what, what that would look like. What, what actually occurs uh, that's uh, financially viable is another thing, but uh, I, I don't believe you'll see wave, you know, amber waves of cannabis uh, blowing in Delanco, so. Mayor, if I may ask um, a, a question because of that, and because in a seminar that I took, but uh, maybe Doug knows the um, cultivation, the growing of the actual cannabis, um, whether it would be it would be indoors, but would that receive a Q, a Q farm tax um, abatement 
as it's a crop. Now, my understanding is finally adopted is that it would not be able to avail itself of Q farm. So, it, so the property taxes due on that would be at a uh, full taxation and not a reduced farm rate. Right. And um, depending on how much uh, occurs at the facility, I would say that these buildings end up looking a lot more like a pharmaceutical manufacturing building than a, a farm. And they would be at full taxation, not Q farm. Right. Good question. Who, who is that? I just said good question. Oh, go ahead. To Janice. Thank you, Kate. You're welcome. Yeah, I uh, last, uh, not this past fall, not the COVID fall, the fall prior to that, uh, when life was normal, uh, I was up in the uh, Catskill region of upstate New York or lower Hudson Valley. And I uh, happened, uh, uh, in town, drove, driving through a town, uh, 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 and there was going to be a seminar that evening on the CBD oil uh, uh, as uh, medicinal. Anyway, um, I, my wife and I attended that, uh, about a dozen people, uh, mostly my age and older, uh, amazingly. But anyway, one of the, one of the comments that uh, was made by, by several people that uh, were in the, the library at this uh, seminar uh, that was sponsored by a local uh, pharmacy uh, in Woodstock, of all places, um, was the smell of harvesting uh, hemp, which is similar species to the cannabis. And uh, just, uh, there were several, many people spoke of the smell. Uh, now, I don't know what, uh, uh, what stage of the processing, whether that's field cut or whether that's in the greenhouse or whether that's a, in a hydroponic uh, uh, warehouse setting, but uh, it was something that was wholly unexpected that that would be a, a, uh, something in the um, not favorable column uh, as far as weighing this issue. So I just wanted to add that in that point. Uh, looking around for any raised hands or People waving. Let me go on the second page here. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I think I saw maybe Miss Darmo raise her hand. There she is. Uh, maybe Ms. Darmo this, once again. Yeah, maybe this was already mentioned. Um, once a license is approved, it's in effect for five years. Then it can be removed. Is that is that what we said? For example, if we approve a license and there's the odor is just, you know, we didn't expect it to be that strong. And even with all their odor mitigation systems, can we then pull that license back after five years? No, that's really one of the warnings that has come out is once you, once you opt in, you're in for five years for whatever permitted uses you have designated. And if somebody establishes under that program in those five years, if after your five years lock-in is over and you revisit it, and we determine that, you know, what this really hasn't worked out for us where the tax revenue wasn't what we thought it was going to be or the benefits aren't outweighing the negatives, we can change our zoning and now zone everything out of use. But anybody who has already established themselves as a permitted use under that program during that time period would be permitted, legally required to be permitted to stay. Okay, that tells me that I want to move slowly. I want to visit areas in New Jersey that have medical marijuana growing facilities. And um, I just feel like we want to move slowly because of that. And that's my comment. Uh, seeing that things have kind of slowed down, let me, uh, uh, Mr. Schwab, do you have anything as far as procedurally how this would, uh, uh, the path it would take uh, to make, uh, that we would hit the August 21st deadline? Thank you, I think Doug could explain that, but you did before. The League of Municipalities has provided a sample ordinance uh, to use if you wish to opt out 
and uh, their general, I don't call that advice, but their uh, information points out could be to opt out initially to make sure you don't get stuck opting in uh, unintentionally. And then when, as I think was mentioned before, you've studied how other towns, have, how it's worked out elsewhere and the kinks down the line, you know more information on the finances, uh, what the taxes could bring in or not, or you have an application. There are half a dozen people contacting us already saying, you know, are you gonna allow us to make a proposal? And you decide to do that, then you can uh, put together a, a zoning ordinance that would permit it or conditionally permit it or whatever method you wish to do to meet your particular needs as opposed to just leaving it wide open. So they're, they're pointing out that if you want maximum control, that's the simplest way to have maximum control. So that's, that's my only comment. If we do do an ordinance, as I mentioned before, because it's a land use ordinance, uh, you would introduce, the township committee would introduce it. We would advertise it for public hearing, generally in the following month. But in the meantime, that ordinance would go to the joint land use board, who would then look at it as it relates to the master plan, make an observation as to whether or not it's consistent with the master plan, make that recommendation back to the township committee. Township committee takes that, has a public hearing, similar to what we're having tonight, but legally. And then at some point after that could vote yes or no. And then it gets advertised that it's been adopted or otherwise, and then it becomes effective. If I have that correct, Doug. All right, I got, uh, let's see, uh, Ms. Madison, I see you waving there, go ahead. She's muted. You're muted, Ms. Madison. Unmute, please. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, Elizabeth Madison, 737 Franklin Street. Um, I just wanted to make a comment on um, what the mayor said about the smell of um, potential growing facilities. Um, I did briefly look over some of the materials that the township had posted regarding this issue. And one was uh, potential environmental impacts of uh, a growing facility. And it did state that smell is the number one complaint about growing facilities. Um, the plants really smell when they're growing, even just um, before they're harvested or whatever, they, they, they smell pretty strong. Um, so I wanted to make wanted to just make that comment that it was in that uh, literature. Um, I would also um, like to point out that it's a heavy water use, the growing of these plants. They're hydroponic. Um, so that would be something that the town would want to take into consideration. Um, I don't know how they dispose of the waters after they're used. Um, and they would probably be fairly heavy, heavily laden with uh, chemicals, fertilizers, and pesticides, because I think it is a pretty heavy feeder of crop, especially to get you know, the quality of um, the marijuana that they want. Um, and also, if they do build greenhouses rather than a building, the lights are going to be on pretty much 24-7, which I think would adversely impact probably the whole town, but certainly anybody who was living nearby, it's gonna really disrupt the night sky. Um, and so in a, along that line, you would also potentially affect um, night flying birds, other creatures that you know are night dwelling if um, a greenhouse was operating 24 seven. So, um, and I'd also just like to make a comment that if retail um, were to be located in our town, I would think that for traffic considerations that it should be placed as close to 130 as possible. Just because I think we would get business from Pennsylvania. We're pretty accessible, especially with the light rail. So, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Yes, we're who who's speaking? 
Mr. Mayor, this is this is Tom Fine, uh -huh. fifteen on one Second Street, Delanco. Good evening, Mr. Fine. I'm sorry. Good evening. Go ahead, sir. Uh, speaking from the Sewer Port of Sewerage Authority, uh, we talked briefly about this at our meeting uh, earlier in the week, and the Class One, Class Two, as pointed out by Matt and others, has a significant water usage. And uh, from what I understand, the DEP would be involved uh, to make sure that the level of particulate that went into the uh, sewer system is is within the limits. Uh, it's not only the water that's a, a utility that's an issue, it's power uh, um, as well. So, I mean, the, the power company would, would also have to be involved. But as far as the sewer is concerned, there would be DEP guidance to uh, take care of wastewater, which would be significant in both class one and class two. Thank you. Hello. Oops, says the president of the sewage authority. Thank you, Mr. Finan. Uh, you. Let me look across and see if there's any other hands raised. Uh, Mrs. Lord, do you have any comments as far as uh, procedural processes uh, in addition to what uh, Mr. Schwab's comments were? Well, first, I, I'd just like to clear up. We do have uh, one uh, comment in the chat section that I'd like to put on the record from Carolyn Seuss, 1605 Second Street. And she types, I am for anything but retail. It would be a nice source of tax revenue for the town. Uh, also for the record, we had some advanced comments of the meeting. I'd like to put those on the record. Received um, via email from uh, Lou Barish, uh, 1409 Burlington Avenue. Uh, and this is what he typed. Alcohol is not allowed in Delanco. Why should cannabis be allowed? If it is allowed, a fair share tax should be applied, not the 2% mentioned. A fair share tax of 50% for big business is required. And we have... Um, an email from Ms. Uh, Viera De Ponte for Wolverton Place um, saying that I am in favor of allowing cannabis business in Delanco. And we have a third email received from John Piaget. Um, I want to express my opinion to the Township Committee regarding the cannabis legislation. If I understand it correctly, if the committee votes no on all parts, then one uh, can always opt in at any time. However, there was a time limit of opting out if any or all parts of the legislation legislature are accepted. With that in mind, my opinion would be to opt out on all to give the committee more time to assess which, if any of these of the sections of the law, they would like to participate. Thank you for your time. And. And that's what I have, uh, the three emails that were received before the meeting. And again, um, uh, Ms. Seuss's uh, ch chat comment at, during this meeting. Thank you. And procedurally, just again, <clears throat> there is a time limit um, that if you uh, want do, to do an opt out ordinance or um, provide for specific zoning for um, any of the uses, the, the five or six classifications as well as zoning designations. There is a deadline to do those ordinances and you have to, the committee has to give itself enough time to introduce it, send it to the land use board for its consistency review, plan, uh, can, a master plan consistency review, hold, then hold the township committee that has to hold a public hearing um, and, um, prior to adoption. So it is a multi-month process and there is an August deadline. So um, that's all I have procedurally. Thank you. Very good. Um, Mrs. Martin, I'm going to drag you into this as well. Just uh, I think Mrs. Lohr covered most of uh, what you handled there, but anything you want to add there as far as uh, uh, the joint land use board uh, process? Um, no. Once the township committee decides what they want to do and you move forward, we would certainly make sure that the ordinance would be on the joint land use board agenda so that, um, you know, we're not holding up any uh, time frames, not running up against any deadlines to where there would be an emergency situation. All right. Thank you. Um, 
Mike Math Park, and I have one more comment, if I may. Uh, Chief DeSando. Yes, Mayor, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the people have, have spoken, and I'll be full disclosure. I dis disagree with the uh, decision. Uh, 32 years of law enforcement has exposed me to all different um, people involved with, you know, marijuana and different types of drugs. And, and uh, I see a correlation to experience, but uh, the people's will is what the people's will is. So this brings me down to what our question is. Uh, the biggest obstacle it's going to be for law enforcement regarding the legalization is going to be one, and the most important one, which I don't know if anybody's really thought about, is traffic fatalities and traffic accidents as a result of being on the influence. Right now, there's no real technology to detect if you're under the influence at the time of the accident. There's technology to determine whether it's um, marijuana or cannabis in your system. And that's just going to open a can of worms in terms of uh, court fights and court battles. So some type of um, uh, technology is, is, I guess, commercialized and sold. Uh, in you know, Colorado, their fatalities nearly doubled, which involved marijuana. Uh, so uh, it's something the unintended consequences that I don't know if people really thought about. And it's been very difficult with marijuana being legal for law enforcement to actually enforce under the influence uh, just based on detecting odor. As the attorney general has placed strict guidelines on reference to how to conduct searches and, and stops based on the odor of marijuana. Um, so that leads me to, I think it's not best to have a retailer. Um, I think a cultivator is something that uh, in my opinion may be looked at and my, my philosophy would be is, you know, why tax the little dealer, go for the large, um, the large corporation that's going to be doing all the sales and you get a larger amount of money if you're going to do this. Um, you know, like I said, if it was up to me and I made my vote, I don't believe we should get involved in this. Um, the idea of collecting taxes on it for the benefit of the children, it kind of it's contradictory to me, but, but um, like I said, I, if you're going to look at something, class one, class two is is my objective, you know, professional opinion of uh, something you would possibly open anything to, but anything beyond that, I, I you know, I wouldn't. So that's, I guess, partial, you know, a public safety view and a personal view mixed together. So I, I did my best to try to separate them. Thank you. I appreciate uh, appreciate your uh, years of professional uh, experience in uh, passing that on to us. So thank you, Chief. Mayor, yes. we have we have in the chats uh, section a question from Liz Mattisette. What is the time for submission of written comments to the Township Committee regarding this issue? Thank you. I, I don't know that we've we've set an outer limit. Uh, it will be considering this, uh, I guess we'll have to be making a decision in the next meeting or two in May yeah. and uh, uh, to, to keep on a timeline if we want to hit the August 21st uh, opt-in, opt-out date uh, to preserve all our options. So uh, up until let's say the first meeting in May, which is, when is that? May 3rd. May 3rd. Put the outer limit there for uh, for comments from the public on this. So, and there also uh, will be an opportunity once the ordinance is introduced. There'll be public hearing, and people can that's true. Uh, will be submitting uh, comments and questions uh, for that public hearing. And under, you know, people can submit comments and questions and letters to opinions at Township Committee anytime. All right. Last question, Mr. Bartlett. Yeah, just uh, real quick. Um, my thought is instead of you know opting out now, I, well, I suggest you pass some sort of ordinance now. If you opt out now and then a year down the line, like um, someone mentioned before, a couple people mentioned, you know, it's going to be established at that 
point, there's not going to be any desire to come in here. So if I guess, as the saying goes, if you want to get in on the ground floor, you know, now is the time to do it. Well, if uh, someone wants to come in here and build something, okay. if you're waiting a couple of years down the road, you know, might not be interest. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And two more questions, and then we'll go to the, uh, the uh, committee comments. I think I had one from, uh, let's see, Mr. Martin. Where are you, Dan? Uh, yes, thank you again, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I have a question regarding the timing or the time frame for the Joint Land Use Board to review for consistency with master plan. Uh, I'm looking at our meetings and our first, our next one will be the day after the third or May 4th. Uh, so that gives us one day to get all the information uh, to us. The next one would be on June 1st, uh, which is before the next, before the first June Township Committee meeting. Do those deadlines, do our de uh, meeting schedule meet the uh, technical deadlines? Yeah, Dan, what's traditionally happened in Delanco because the board meets the night after us is if something is introduced on the first meeting and the board needs time, it has time under the statute to carry it to the next meeting. We just have to push out our second reading until we get your feedback. That's and that would be uh, June 7th. So does that, if, work? Does that if, meet the uh, time yeah, frame that, that they've established? That would be well within the time frame. Okay. Um, if we if we introduce mid month, then the board would have it for a couple of weeks, and that has traditionally been enough time. But again, if there's if the board needs time, I think the committee has generally uh, been amenable to to allowing whatever time is needed for that review to occur. Technically. Uh, it's like 35 or 45 days under the statute, but we've never had an issue with it in Delanco. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Martin. Uh, I've got a text that uh, Mr. McFadden has a question. I don't see him in the window here. Yes, I'm here. There you, oh, you're hiding down there. Okay, go ahead. Uh, like what Mr. Uh, Bartlett said, I, I have no. That's what the only, thing. We need oh, name and, and maple. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, with what Matt had said, I agree with it, and the retail is the sticking point for me. Would be where would you locate the retail part of this um, agreement on this? Because the only place I could really think of would be in the 7-Eleven area. And I think that's mostly where our youth hang out. And I, I would have concerns about that. And that was it. The, the state and federal law gets untangled. It's within a thousand feet of Walnut Street School. So, um, anything else, Mr. McFadden? That was it for tonight. And last question, I think I had a saw a hand, uh, uh, Ms. Tersich Keeley. Yes, hi, uh, Catherine Tersich Keeley, 750 <laughs> Rancocas Avenue, speaking as a private citizen. Um, I just wanted to point out, uh, the chief mentioned that there's an increase in traffic accidents. So actually studies that have been done that show that there is no increase in traffic accidents in states that have legalized cannabis. Um, in one state, there was a short uh, period of time where traffic accidents increased, but um, it has since gone back down. So just wanted to state the facts on that particular issue. Can I have your address, please, for the record? Yep, I said 740 Rancocas Avenue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'm just to, I guess, cap it off. I'm pro businesses. I don't like smelly things, so I don't necessarily, or, and I don't also like the idea of the farming you know, uh, having chemicals that leach into our waterways that are surrounding our town. I'm actually not, not pro farming or um, anything that would have a negative environmental impact. I am pro retail um, and other uses in town. So. Thank you. Uh, Township Committee, uh, Ms. Fitzpatrick, you wanna start off? Mayor, 
just just we have a few more that, that people have typed into the chat section under the this session if I may get those on the record. Is that okay? B before you move on to Township Committee? Sure. Sure. Go ahead right. and uh, thank you. Um we did hear from Ms. Keeley um uh, uh, about the traffic uh study. Tammy Hutchinson has said, I've been in the medical marijuana program for over eight years for Crohn's disease. It has helped me not use any other pain meds uh, for when I am in a bad flare. It gives me an appetite when my body does not allow for one. I unfortunately have had to travel a good distance for it. Also, there is not a big supply now for medical, let alone recreational at this time. Any way our town could help um, would be wonderful. Um, I am a renter, but still a big part of the community. Thank you. From Steve McLaughlin, New Jersey voters choose to amend our, chose to amend our constitution over this issue. I do not think it's appropriate for the police chief to say in public that he disagrees with the state constitution. And from Ms. Uh, Darmo, uh, please post on the town website a map with possible sites for different cannabis licenses. Um, that would be a zoning, you know, map, uh, you know, where you would, with the township committee, if they were going to allow different uses, what zones would, um, you allow those uses in? And, um, Doug, if I'm, if I understand correctly, if the township committee does not meet this August deadline one way or another, um, then all uses are available in all our zoning districts. Is that correct? Uh, it's actually a little bit more defined than that, Janice, but there are presumptions about what becomes uh, permitted in any industrial zone and what becomes permitted in any commercial zone. But essentially, uh, if you think about the Lango, our industrial zones would be open to all of the initial classes and then retail would be open in all our commercial zones. And but not automatically in residential zones. No. No. All right. Uh, I'd like to close off the public comment on this right now. Uh, as Mrs. Lohr explained, uh, as, as any ordinances move through the uh, process, uh, will uh, there'll be a, a, a designated required public comment period on those respective ordinances. And so, uh, uh, and we'll accept a comment uh, up until the, uh, the actual vote on those ordinances. So plenty of time remaining, but I'd like to move on. Uh, and just uh, if the township committee members wanna make a comment before we move on in the agenda uh, for tonight. Uh, Mrs. Patrick. You uh, Mike, start. there is someone who's had their hand raised for quite some time now. Um, LG uh, star six on my, on my screen. So I don't know if uh, if they're there, if they can unmute, but they've had their hand raised for quite some time now. So I don't I don't see them now. So I I believe they left. Oh, okay. All right. I'm gonna check though. Hold on just okay. If, any, if anyone does want to make a comment, um, it is important that you unmute. Um, otherwise we cannot hear you. All right. Okay, I, I don't find them in our participants list, so. Okay, all right, let's, so. Let's they... take one and we'll uh, uh, have the committee comments on this item and then uh, uh, we'll move on through the agenda. Uh, Ms. Fitzpatrick? Uh, yes, um, I think that um, under the circumstances with more people sending in comments and what have you, I think we may need more time than just six months to make sure we're doing the right thing. Um, so I would ask Doug that if we, if I understand this correctly, if we opt out right now and let's say six months after the six month period, we decide we wanna opt in for any one of the different categories, can we then do it? That yeah. I believe we can. Yeah. Um, to, to that point in my involvement in this issue and talking to a lot of other attorneys who are in my field, I would say that's becoming the most common approach. Yeah. That, um, yeah. You know, zoning takes time 
Mm -hmm. Everything takes time, but zoning in particular takes time. And I think we've been pretty um, exacting about what we want to do and where. And uh, the again, the most common reaction I think that I'm seeing develop across the state from municipalities is to opt out so that not as a, not as an end to the discussion, but to allow time for the discussion to gather more information and if zoning is going to be undertaken, do it on its own timeline so that it can make sure it gets it right. Right. That, that's how I feel. I just feel that this is going to be rushed and I would rather it be a more of a thoughtful process where we include all the entities in town that would affect. And I don't think that in May, we're gonna have that answer or even in June uh, where we can actually say, well, we're gonna do one through four or we're gonna do all or what have you. Um, I, I, I just feel that we need more time. It just took us almost nine months to get a fence ordinance amended. So I mean, uh, and I appreciate the chief I appreciate the professionals input on all issues. So I think all these things need to be considered and we're, I just think we're in the beginning stages. I think we need more time. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Ms. Holland. Hey, um, yeah, so I've appreciated the, the discussions that, that have taken place tonight and in the days leading up to this. Um, it definitely can't be ignored that our residents did speak um, by voting that they would like to see this legalized in town. Um, but as the governing body, it's our responsibility to govern responsibly, to take their input into consideration and make thoughtful decisions. So to that, I agree with Kate, we need to proceed cautiously, certainly not allow a blanket approval for all of these licenses or all these classes. Um, you know, to, I, somebody made the comment about, you know, no downside to the cannabis cultivator position. And, you know, I, I think in this hour forum, we, we've talked about the environmental impacts, the, um, the intrusion into our residents by uh, light and, and smell. Um, for the, uh, for the class four distri uh, distributor class. Um, I don't think our roads can necessarily support more truck transportation traffic. Um, you know, I, I, there are definite downsides to these, um, but again, our, our residents have spoken and I would think that job creating uh, licenses such as manufacturer I hesitate with the wholesaler and the retailer, but you know I'm, I'm I'm open to them. But I think that we need to hit the pause button for perhaps six months or so, just to uh, to research and and make sure that we're making informed decisions. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Alette. Turn audio mute. Mr. Light, you're muted. There he goes. We still cannot hear you. Mr. Alette, you still cannot be heard. Okay. Uh, uh, Is it your computer's volumes down or turned off? Yeah, we're not getting anything out of them. All right. Uh, well, I'd like to close this. Uh, as far as my comments on this, as uh, is, is, has been mentioned, uh, I actually think this is going to be like the defense ordinance. You know, it sounds simple from a distance and say, oh, yeah, we can change. A, we'll just modify something on the fence ordinance. And I think it's going to come down to location, location. Uh, that's going to be the hard thing on whatever category or whatever class. Um, if any or all or none that uh, we decide on. Uh, and uh, I remember seeing one article that, uh, you know, 
residents of a, of a community voted overwhelmingly, like we've seen here statewide. Uh, but when it came down to actual placement of a facility or retail, uh, a little bit of the NIMBY uh, appeared and people were okay with it at the ballot, uh, at the polling place voting for it. But when it showed up across the street or next door or uh, next to their kid's school, uh, their, uh, their view of things changed. So um, I think the safe thing that uh, may happen as has been alluded to is hit the pause on this because I think the location um, and there's a lot of other stuff, uh, the things that uh, Mr. Fine and Ms. Madison mentioned, the environmental issues, uh, consumption, utilities, traffic, uh, all these things. Uh, it's it's going to be an interesting calculus, uh, uh, and it's going to need time to digest all that. So um, I'd like to close this portion. As I said, uh, whatever ordinances we do, either opt in, opt out, uh, there'll be public comment to uh, opportunities. If you've got something on your mind, uh, send it in via email to Mrs. Lord, uh, galancotownship.com, Jay Lord, and uh, she'll put it on the record uh, at the next meeting when this comes up. So I do thank uh, everyone for their participation and coming out tonight on this topic. And I'd like to move on to the next item. Uh, let's see. Presentation, uh, New Jersey Community Solar Program. Um, I don't know if this was a casualty of COVID or what. Uh, this, uh, uh, I, th I think about a, literally a year ago, uh, there were attempts to put some people together and uh, there was a state, uh, quasi state uh, private uh, entity that was supposed to be uh, the go-between and uh, communication with uh, Sustainable Jersey uh, through the um, College of New Jersey uh, Sustainability Institute kind of broke down and we never quite uh, uh, got together uh, literally uh, from a year ago, April. And I think at that time we were uh, scrambling to buy a N95 mask for uh, seven, eight bucks a piece. So to outfit our police and fire and EMS. So uh, I've got, uh, let's see in the windows here, I've got uh, Miss Orlo who, if I've got it right, is from Neighborhood Sun. Yes. And there's also a, a Zach Meyer. Where did he go there? There he is. And he's uh, representing a Soltage, Soltage, Soltage. Soltage. Yeah. Voltage. Uh, I keep wanting to say voltage or whatever. Anyway, uh, I don't know who's going to start or if it's going to be a collaborative uh, discussion. Uh, but this is uh, regarding the uh, solar field, solar farm. Uh, that's been built on the uh, former Winsinger uh, landfill on uh, Coopertown Road. Um, it's one of the uses that's been found for remediated landfills that seems to be successful is uh, to put these solar farms on this uh, since they're not usually able to support any kind of uh, hard uh, buildings or, or permanent construction uh, otherwise. So uh, that's the location of this. The front part of uh, that project is in place and I believe uh, is hot, is live. And that's providing dedicated power to the uh, RLS facility across the street. The back part of it uh, is uh, what's called a community solar, which is, uh, um, well, I'll let you, let you two explain it. So um, whoever is gonna lead off, uh, go for it. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to uh, thank everybody on the committee for allowing us to speak tonight. My name is Randy Orlo and I'm the New Jersey Community Solar Program Director for Neighborhood Sun and we are the outreach and education arm of this project and uh, partnered with Saltage. They, they brought us on to educate the community so that's what we're doing. And the reason why we wanted to speak to you tonight is because this is in your town. You had, you know, you're lucky enough to have this project in your town and you drive by it every day. And I'm sure you probably have questions or, you know, might not even know how it works, which would not be unusual at all. So we thought we would um, use this opportunity to tell you more about community solar, how it works, how, um, how you can join if you want, and um, just a little bit more about 
neighborhood sun and about soltage so you have an idea of what we're doing in your community. Um, before I share my screen, I also want to introduce Zach Meyer of Saltage. He is the manager of development. That's right. Saltage. And yes, thank you for having us. Thanks to Mayor Templeton and Ms. Fitzpatrick, Ms. Lohr, the whole committee and, and the town for having us here tonight. Yeah, we're excited to be here. So I'm gonna attempt to share my screen. Um, you will not be able to share your screen. Um, I'm going to have to give you the host permission and you'll have to change it back. Okay. Okay. Hang on just one moment. Sure. Take your time. I can juggle in the meantime. Okay. You are all set. Great. Now I just need to find. Uh, why am I not seeing? I'm not seeing my. There we go. All righty. Okay. All right. So a um, little bit about Neighborhood Sun. We are a mission-focused organization um, that our focus is just creating stronger communities through community solar. Um, we are a grassroots company. We started in Maryland and uh, we've been in New Jersey. I live in New Jersey, but we've been in New Jersey since the uh, New Jersey Community Solar Pilot Program was adopted in 2019. And um, a little bit of information, we are a certified B Corp. And if you're unfamiliar with, a, with what a benefit corp is, it's really, a, it's a business model a third party business model that really focuses on um, standards of the highest standards of environmental and social performance. Um, it's really something where it been the, the purpose of each company of a benefit company is to just do meet the greater good for everyone involved. So um, one thing that I just definitely want to say, because I'm super proud of this, is that B Corps, it's an international organization, and um, we're, we're rated every year. We, we're scored every year based on our performance of transparency and our commitment to the communities that we serve and um, the environment. And we have a score of 130.5 which makes us the leader out of all the community solar companies um, in the United States. And it also makes us a leader in the entire B Corp community with um, one of the highest scores. So just really proud of that. So I'm gonna turn this over uh, for, to Zach so he can tell you a little bit about Soltage. Sure. Um, so Soltage is the owner and manager you know, of this facility, as well as the directly adjacent one that Mayor Templeton mentioned serving the, the next door um, RLS cold storage facility. Um, we were founded in 2006 in Jersey City, New Jersey. We now have over 300 megawatts of solar assets across the US in uh, 15 states and growing. Um, I don't know if, you know, it makes the most sense to read every bullet point here, but we, um, you know, we've we've started kind of in the Northeast and in, in our home state of New Jersey and have expanded. Um, we tend to work with the most tried and true technology. So, um, you know, you won't see us doing anytime soon, won't see us doing like a floating solar facility or that kind of thing. We're kind of used the most tried and true uh, technology there as well. 
uh, we always make sure we work with the best partners, which is why we're teamed up with Neighborhood Sun. Um, and you can kind of see the timeline there of how we've grown. Um, so, you know, New Jersey company that's very uh, excited to have this community solar project in Delanco. Um, and I also want to, uh, again, thank the township for the letter of support that when we initially applied to the state in this competitive community solar program, I do think that helped uh, to make this possible. So, um, you know, we're, we're, I'm, I'm here uh, to answer any questions and, and we're the, the owner and operator. Thank you. All right, so uh, there you go. Welcome to the new world of solar. And that's exactly what this is. That is uh, Neighborhood Sun CEO, Gary Skolnick, that's standing in front of a solar share of a solar farm. And the solar farms are exactly what, you're, what you see at 900 Coopertown Road. Um, they are large arrays of solar panels that generate energy from the sun um, within a specific utility area and within a specific geographic area within that utility area. Um, this is, you know, it's a new concept for New Jersey. We are incredibly lucky in this state to have this opportunity um, to have community solar as one of our renewable energy sources. So, uh, so how it works, what is community solar? Okay, so what you would do is you would find your plan and I'm gonna tell you this just very generally, whether it's uh, the Tri-County Solar Farm at 900 Coopertown or whether it's another one, um, but you would find your solar plan and what happens is you're given a share for, of the solar farm. So it's kind of like a CSA where, um, you know, a, a community, what is that community service? Uh, agriculture, <laughs> yes. Um, so, you know, where you would get a certain amount of produce that a farm generated it works similarly, you know, similar to that. The only difference is this is solar energy rather than produce. And um, the big difference is that you don't have to pay for your share of the solar farm, unlike with the share of the CSA where you do need to give them an upfront payment. There is no upfront payment for this. So you would find your solar plan. And what would happen is when you sign up, you're gonna, you would tell us, um, what your PSENG number was. And that way we can call PSENG and ask them what your historical usage is for your electricity, what your electricity usage is. And that helps us determine what size share of the farm you would get. So in other words, if you live in a one bedroom apartment by yourself, then your share is going to be a smaller share than it would be if you lived with eight people in a six bedroom house. Um, I live in a condo, but I have electric heat. So I would probably have a greater share than somebody that might live in a four bedroom house that doesn't have electric heat. So it just, it all depends. Every, every household is different, um, but that does help us determine whether you would get a half a panel or a full panel or five panels or whatever it is. And so the energy that those panels or what your solar share generates from the sun is going to go into the grid. And um, when that goes into the grid for PSENG, they have to credit you. They're going to reward you or credit you for putting energy into the grid rather than using dirty energy um, from fossil fuels. So you will receive credits, what they call solar credits on your electric usage bill. And, um, and then on top of that, you would get a discount, a 10% discount on top of that uh, once you were billed by Neighborhood Sun for your solar share. So, or for the, the, uh, the you would actually be billed for the, the, the amount of energy that your panels generated, which is going to equal um, the solar credits and you would get a discount on that. So your, your bill will always, always, always be 10% less than it would be 
with community solar than it would be without community solar. So before I go on and tell you more about the community solar program, I want to just have, <laughs> he made this very easy for me, but Bill Matt from the Environmental Planning Board, um, he was actually one of our very first subscribers for this um, project. And I asked him, um, Zach and I asked him if he would join us tonight just to address, you know, the project and how he feels about it and why he decided to become one of the very first um, subscribers. So if you're here, Bill. Still here. Okay, here you go. Most of you folks know me. I've been in town about 30 years now. Uh, I'm a member of the Shade Tree Commission, the Environmental Board, and the Planning Board. I've been looking to do something sustainable with my energy usage for years. Solar looked like a natural, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. A, I didn't want to put uh, any panels on the roof of my 110-year-old house because I didn't think you could take it. Secondly, I love trees, as most of you know, so I didn't want to cut any of my trees down. So when I finally saw this email came through from the South Jersey Sustainability Network, didn't come from solar folks. It was a referral from Ed Cohen, who's president of South Jersey Sustainability. I jumped on it. In fact, I couldn't believe how few people had actually signed up for it yet. It seemed like a natural to me. A, you're getting local electrons. You're not getting power from who knows where. In fact, if you look at my background picture, that's a coal mine in central Pennsylvania. It's a big open pit, which is where all our power used to come from. PSC&G used to burn a lot of coal and oil. This helps us avoid that. It supports the microgrid theory where by compartmentalizing your energy, it's less susceptible to things like hurricanes and whatnot. And it's gonna be cheaper. So it seemed like a win, win, win in all aspects for me. So I forwarded the, uh, the information to a few friends of mine in town. Actually, I'm surprised how few of them bid on it, but uh, I think a lot of people were burned in the past by a lot of these clean energy providers that basically sell you wind energy or something from out of state and then do some math with your power bill to give you a uh, credit. Sometimes it worked out, sometimes it didn't. This looks like it's uh, straight 10% credit all the way down. So I don't see why anybody wouldn't do it. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's it really is a wonderful program. There's about, I think, Zach, is it about 14 states in the United States that have programs, some more I think it's than even, others? I think it's even a few more now. There, there's different kind of varieties of community solar around the country, but yeah, it's, it's really a growing actually the, the fastest growing segment of solar uh, in the US. And the reason for that is just, and Bill alluded to this, is that not everybody can get the, um, can get solar panels for a million different reasons. So, uh, and we'll get to this slide in a minute, but about 80% of people cannot get solar panels um, for one reason or the other. Could be that you live in an apartment building, could be that you, uh, your backyard is too shady, or you have an old roof and you aren't able to replace it, or you live in a condominium. There are so many different reasons why people can't get or might not want, maybe it's a, you know, a financial issue that they just don't want um, solar panels on their homes. So Community Solar was really born um, or really adopted by the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities who regulates um, the community solar program, they did it for two reasons. So one is to um, help New Jersey realize Governor Murphy's goal of 50% renewable energy by 2030 or 100% renewable energy by 2050, which is sounds like a lofty goal, but wow, we're doing a lot of great things in this state. So um, I hope we get there. I hope I around <laughs> to see it. Um, and then also, and more importantly, to address, to address the environmental energy and economic injustice within our most underserved neighborhoods or most underserved communities. And so community solar basically allows everyone 
the it enables everyone the availability of solar energy, regardless of the dwelling that you live in, regardless of your income, regardless of where you live. Um, everybody can have the benefits of solar energy. Um, the New Jersey program, um, this is a pilot program. We just are ending the first year of the New Jersey Community Solar Pilot Program. And in the first year, approximately 77 megawatts of projects were approved in year one. I don't know how many actually were built. Do you know that, Zach, how many of those? I think most of them are, are going to get to the finish line. We are a little bit ahead of the curve. Um, you know, I think that this is probably going to be the first landfill project to uh, to actually turn on and, and you know, send power to the grid uh, in year one. But, uh, you know, um, the, the rooftops, I think a, a number of the rooftops have already turned on and, and you know, we're right. kind of moving along. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. Um, so the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities is actually doubling the capacity of the program for year two of the pilot program to 150 megawatts. So um, even though this is a new concept for New Jersey to take in right now, in a very short time, I think everybody's gonna know about community solar just by virtue of seeing these farms all over the place. And the farms, again, are either, you know, they're on brown fields, they make good use of brown fields, they can be on industrial rooftops, as Zach just mentioned. They can even be on um, uh, parking lot canopies. So there's, you know, we're making good use of surfaces that wouldn't be used for anything else. So this is really important. Um, again, subscribers get full retail for their solar credits through net metering. And uh, New Jersey really encourages projects that serve low and moderate income subscribers for the reasons that I had mentioned. You know, we're, we're really forging ahead with um, trying to just build a state that is based on energy and, uh, and environmental equity. And uh, let's see, I'm gonna go to the next slide. This is what I was saying, 80% can install rooftop solar for one reason or another. Now everyone can participate. Again, this is kind of what, of, what different um, shares might look like on the solar farm. And so the Tri-County Solar Farm, we named it the Tri-County Solar Farm because it, it serves three counties. So it's PSENG customers in Burlington County, Mercer County, and Camden County. It's a 3.1 megawatt project. You know where it is, it's on the closed landfill um, on, at 900 Coopertown Road. And all subscribers now will receive a 10% discount on their PSE electric usage bill. And that's guaranteed for 20 years. Our contract is a 20 year contract, but that guarantee is protects you as the subscriber um, you know it's not like we can come back six months from now and say okay we decided to change the amount of the discount moving forward it's only going to be five percent or it's nothing um, so that is that's very important also what's important is that to note is that this is a discount on your electric usage bill so it's primarily for your um, delivery and service charges. It's not going to be on any fixed charges. It's more of the, the variable charges. There's no fee to enroll. So unlike the CSA, you don't have to pay in advance for your share of the farm. And if you wanted to cancel for any reason, actually people don't cancel, but if you did want to cancel for any reason, um, there's no cancellation fee, there's no hassle. We're not going to say, sure, give us 500 bucks and you know we'll cancel it. It's, it's a pretty easy process. And even better, if you're interested in, if you move and you move within the PSCNG territory, you can actually take your share with you. So you would just, you know, it would just be a matter of calling us and saying, I'm moving, um, here's my new address. And then we would resize you eventually. But um, it's also a good, you know, if you're selling your house, you can 
use that as a sales tool to just say, hey, you know, the house comes with um, a solar share and then you know, we would just transfer the, the share into the new owner's name. Or if you're renting your house, it's a featured, um, you know, they, that it would come with the solar share, which would be an automatic discount on their electric usage. There's nothing to buy. You don't have to install anything. You don't have to rent anything. There's no equipment. There's no wires that are gonna go directly to your house, but you will be responsible for putting clean energy, putting clean renewable energy, from a local source, you can't get more local than where you are, right into the grid. Um, this goes on to say basically everything that I told you and let's see. And so this is, you probably haven't seen, unless you're flying helicopters around the neighborhood, you probably have not seen this view of the farm and, and this is the aerial view. Um, and it's really, I have to say, I was uh, telling someone earlier that it's really cool when you watch it, watching it get built. I, I went to the farm at different stages of construction and it really does look like what you would imagine a solar farm to look like or a solar garden. Sometimes they're called solar gardens, but you know, it's just this plot of dirt. And when they start putting the poles in, it really does look like solar panels, you know, are growing out of, out of the dirt. Um, and creating this pretty impressive solar farm. So that's what it looks like now. And <clears throat> another thing that we wanted to mention is that uh, one, you know, we have various ways of spreading the, the word about community solar and letting people in within the community know uh, what projects are happening. The, the method that we, that is our preferred method is to develop community partnerships um, with nonprofits or faith-based groups or municipalities, um, civic groups. And what we do is we collaborate with one another and we, we provide all sorts of marketing materials, anything that an organization could need and they help to amplify the message about a project. And they tell their constituents, their members, and anyone who signs up through that partner, uh, Neighborhood Sun makes a nice donation to that partner, to that organization. And we typically give a gift card as a thank you to the person that subscribes. So we'll get, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, further down um, because um, we have presented something to um, Mayor Templeton about understanding that we can't necessarily, that Delanco Township can't necessarily be a partner, an official partner, but we, what we would be willing to do is um, give Delanco their own URL and anyone who signed up using that URL, which would bring you to the Delanco landing page, we would make a $200 donation so that Delanco could use, um, for each person that signs up, we could make, the, they could use that donation towards an organization um, within Delanco. So we would just need to know what that one organization is that you want to earmark and then we would make a donation. In addition to that, we're giving, we're rewarding everyone for being good environmental stewards by um, giving you, a, giving all subscribers a hundred dollar gift card uh, to, it's called a Tango gift card. And it's good for about 80 different major retailers. So it's just our way of saying thank you for um, being part of this program and, uh, taking the initiative to do something really good for your community. These are some of the partners that we have in New Jersey. And this is what your bill, what your PSENG bill would look like. It has the solar credits right here. It's going to be, you know, tell you exactly um, what, how much energy your, your solar share has generated. And so you'll see your bill especially if you have um, 
you know, everything is powered by electricity in your household, you're going to see your bill drop pretty significantly. Uh, typically, a share will cover, it's between 50 and 95% of your electric usage. Most likely, if unless you're on energy assistance, it will be like between 90 and 95. Um, uh, tell me if I'm, if I, if I just inflated that, Zach, but I'm pretty sure that it's 90 to 95. Yeah, I think we've been sizing to people, 90% of people's historic usage. So it is, that is worth noting while we're looking at the bill, as you know, as Randy mentioned, we can't, we can't eliminate the monthly charge, but anything that's a dollar per kilowatt hour charge, that's what we offered, you know, the guaranteed discount on. Yeah, so this would just tell you again, it's going to break everything down for you and then, you know, uh, show you everything about your community solar status and your, your share. Um, I will point out here that at this very moment, as we speak, New Jersey has what is called a, a dual bill system, meaning that you would get a bill from PSENG um, uh, probably about a month after the project starts to generate energy, it goes live and starts to generate energy. And then the month following is when you would get billed from Neighborhood Sun for the solar credits that you received from PSENG, less 10%. So again, those two bills will always equal less than if you only received your energy from PSENG. Um, we, a few weeks ago, we went before the Board of Public Utilities to ask for consolidated billing. Um, we understand that that's important to most residents that they would like everything on one bill. We're all for that. Um, and Zach, I think it's gonna happen. Do you think it's gonna happen? Oh, it's, yeah, it's definitely gonna happen. Um, right. I think because we're, you know, we're kind of on the cutting edge in this year one of the program, it's true that you'll have, to, so just to use a simple example, if, if you go to the last slide, Randy, um, Oh, I, I don't That's know okay. going to let me go. Through. Let's say that the credits on your PSE&G bill are worth $100. Then your fee for to be a subscriber is going to be $90, thereby saving you $10 that month. You know, so that's, that's how it's currently set up. After New Jersey rolls out the consolidated billing, you won't even have to worry about that. It'll all be on your PSE&G bill. But for the next year or so, it's, and not to mention it's auto pay anyway, so you don't have to think about it. But um, that's kind of how the savings are realized. You know, you get, um, again, let's say it's $100 credit on your PSE&G bill, and then you pay the solar farm $90, giving you a $10 savings. Okay. And, you know, the savings are wonderful, um, but the environmental benefits are what we're, you know, doing this for to help people, you know, like our, our kids and our grandchildren. This is an issue that we, you know, we helped cause it and we need to help clean it up. So, um, you know, this just kind of shows you what the average community solar customer prevents. The equivalent of 10 hot air balloons filled with CO2, 12,000 pounds of coal burned, 27,300 27, miles driven. So it's like basically taking your car off the road. Um, these numbers for our impact in the projects that we uh, have so far, those are for our Maryland projects where community solar has been in existence, I think, until uh, since about 2015, 2016. And so this is uh, for about seven projects. Our New Jersey project has not turned on yet, uh, but it will. And then we'll add to that, add to those numbers. So, oh, I'm not Carolyn Brickett, sorry about that. but. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, this is a, a good time to ask. I don't have any questions. I did I did talk to you today, Randy, and I talked to Zach uh, as well the other day, and I did sign up today. Um, it's you. a win-win, as Bill had said, and uh, I understand that we have about 103 more places where residents of Delanco can sign up. Yes, so um, we had about 750 shares 
And we're almost at capacity, but we have about 100 chairs left. Um, and that was also the reason why we wanted to be here tonight, because we do have, and we're very grateful to have uh, Delanco residents signed up. Um, as I said before, Bill and Ed DeVinney were uh, two of the first subscribers to the farm. Um, but, you know, this is, this is such an important thing. You know, this, it's kind of like Delanco is making history by, have, by hosting this solar farm because this is going to be one of the first farms to, in the, in the first year of the pilot program in New Jersey, to go live. And, um, you know, it's really putting Delanco on the map. And I just, you know, we think that everyone in Delango deserves to have an opportunity to sign up and to save money and to be part of this project that they're going to drive by every single day. So, um, yeah, right now we have about 100 shares left. Um, and the URL that you see right here, ah, no, come back. Oh no. Uh, the URL that you see here is um, is what you would want to, that's what you would want to click on to get to the Delango landing page. And if we do get permission to make donations, this is how we would know um, that you signed up through Delanco. And that's the only way, it, um, rather than going through our, our um, the Neighborhood Sun website, this is how we would know that you're signing up through Delanco. And we would know to give the donation and you would get your $100 gift card. So um, if you want to reach me directly, if you have any questions, do you think about it tomorrow and you, you know, said, oh, I should have asked this, feel free to email me at randy at neighborhoodsun.solar. Um, my phone number 856-473-4808. And uh, yeah, we're here for more questions if anybody has anything that they wanna say or comments or. Can you return the screen back to uh, Mrs. Pervenzano and so I we can, can see the rest of the public there? Sure. And I do, this is Zach from Soltage. I do see one um, question in the chat that I can address from um, a, a Miss Arlene Taraski. And um, it says, what protection do you have from hackers cutting off the power supply? So, you know, we've got our own security with the chain link fence and security cameras, but we also comply with PSE and G's security protocol that they would put on any, what is called a distributed generation asset. So any you know, kind of small power plant of this size. Um, so we've, you know, we've got those kind of multiple layers of, of, of protection. Randy, this is Linda Gaffney. Um, I did say Hi, that. <laughs> um, yeah. You just remind people like to, in the sign up process, it does ask you for a couple of things like your PSC and G account number and just remind people what they would have to have it ready to answer the questions. Sure, that's a great comment, Linda. And thank you for signing up. I, Linda and I have known each other for many years. Um, so yeah, when it's probably good to be prepared if you do go to sign up. So you wanna have your PSENG account number ready. And again, we need that because um, we're gonna call PSENG and ask for your historical usage and that will help us determine what size share of the solar farm that you'll receive. And you're also, it's going to ask you for your payment information and um, we are, everything is done electronically. So uh, you have two options, either by paying through credit card or through ACH payments. And the reason why we ask you for that information now is really two reasons. One, it kind of acts as a placeholder um, for your share of the farm because otherwise people could just easily sign up and then Maybe they would decide not to move forward with, with it, and that would just kind of put us off balance um, when it's time to turn on to make, turn the project on um, live. And the other reason, and I guess this is the most important one, is we need to know how we're going to get paid because this is a dual billing system. We need to know 
how you would how you're going to pay us. Um, I can tell you that in no way would we ever, even though we'll have that information, you will not be billed until the project turns on, until you receive your credits from PSCNG, and then after that, you would be, be billed from Neighborhood Sun. Um, but that information is not going anywhere until the project turns on and starts generating energy. Uh, Randy, can you turn over the host back to uh, uh, back to Aaron? Yes, if you can guide me on how to do that, I'll, I'd be happy to. Okay, Randy, um, just find the name host. Oh, okay. Okay, and then click yeah, on the I three see. dots, and that's yeah. all. There okay. you go. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Sorry about that. And so we we returned our TV screen back to our <laughs> back to our control. Um, I'm gonna have to leave and come back. It's not working. But I'm switched over. Oh, geez. Okay. Oops. Couldn't um, hear for a while. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question in the chat. Um, from Liz Mattisette, is the program only for residents? What about businesses, government offices? I can take that one. So it is only for residents. The, this community solar program is, is targeted toward residents. Um, I did speak with uh, Mr. Finan um, uh, about, for, you know, from the sewer authority about um, how Soltage may be able to help Delanco with some of the township electric accounts. Um, and other, you know, related public entities like the sewerage authority, um, that would have to be something we pursue separate from this community solar project. And I, I do hope that we can, we can, you know, service the town, um, with more solar projects, but, um, this particular one is, is for residents. Uh, my, my question, it seems the, the marketing strategy seems odd, um, that you depend on on community service groups or volunteers or, or boards and stuff to basically do your marketing for you. Uh, and at least in this case, with, with the year's delay, uh, it would seem that a direct mailing uh, information or advertising in, in local media uh, would, have, would have gotten you the customers you, you were looking for. We actually, we do all of those things. Yeah, so, that's how we got the first 600 or yeah. so. <laughs> We do all of those things. Um, you know, it's just that, and especially with COVID, um, you know, our plans didn't necessarily uh, go in the direction that we were aiming them for. And so we have, you know, any method of, of marketing we do use. But what I was saying about our community partners, that's the one that's the nearest and dearest to our heart because we're keeping you know, we're, we're providing um, donations, we're supporting local organizations, and that's important. That's part of our mission as a B Corp. So that, you know, but yes, we, we do extensive digital advertising. We have done, um, we, we've done direct mail. Uh, in fact, I think Anyone that is in a 55 plus community in Delango did receive a direct mail piece from us. Um, possibly everyone else might have received one from us in Delango as well. Uh, yeah, we, I mean, we do all types of marketing, but our preferred method is definitely, our favorite method is definitely through our, our uh, community partners. Like we have several uh, uh, developments in the last couple of years that would seem to fit into the uh, your LMI categories that seem to be what this is, at least from the, from the sustainable uh, view is, is what it was targeted for. Uh, have you contacted them directly uh, to access or? Yeah, so um, for example, the Cornerstone um, affordable housing development, we did reach out to their, their owners or managers um, and, and, and didn't, you know, didn't really strike up a partnership with them. And, and also, um, you know, affordable housing uh, buildings turned out to be a little tougher than, than we kind of thought, because even if we talk, 
talk to someone who owns a big affordable housing building with, with many tenants, you know, they can't sign up their residents on their behalf most of the time. Sometimes they can if it's a master metered building, but those ones are usually on commercial rates and that kind of throws us off a bit. So it has kind of been, I know what you're, you know, I know what you're saying. It would be great to sort of find an owner of a development like that and, and cover so many subscribers in, in one in one housing development. But um, for, you know, sort of for those technical reasons, it's kind of been more of a, what we sometimes call onesies and twosies, you know, each, each household one at a time. Um, Zach, um, it's, it's my understanding that there is a percentage of uh, low and moderate income that must be um, reached and that you have reached that um, percent. Correct. That, that's why you're now moving on to fill uh, the rest of the farm with residents from Delanco. Correct. We did Our, meet, we already met, met, yeah. Right. You met that obligation. And actually, they don't have to be from Delanco, I believe Randy had told me, but it would be nice that our residents had an opportunity to fill the remaining spaces that are available. Exactly. I mean, the long and short of it is, is you know, we kind of, Randy and I and other folks working this sort of looked at each other and, and realized, well, you know, the project's going to fill up before long and we, we would like to have more folks right in the, you know, right in Delanco. Um, so right. that's, that's kind of what spurred this. So I appreciate the fact that you did contact me last month because here you are before Delanco Township right now and hopefully you'll fill those vacant pieces to that farm. So I think it's great. Thank you. I appreciate you contacting me. Thank you. So, you know, we, we really appreciate your help with this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Are there any other questions from the uh, committee on this? Burn, Chris. Nope. And then, so Mayor Templeton, you'll let us know about um, how you how the committee feels about the donation system, and if you can, uh, if you have one organization that you know, whether it's your fire department or your library or. or one entity that the donations would be funneled to. Um, please let us know. It's then. only one. We can't can't split or two or five. Yeah, or... I was hoping we could split, <laughs> but wait. But it, it's it's just one. Okay, uh, that'll probably be the most difficult decision. Uh, you know what? I I will make the decision to say that yes, you can split between two. I will allow you to split between two. It's uh, you know it's I. I probably can't go beyond that because then it just starts to get to be a, you know, a bookkeeping thing. Um, but yes, two organizations or, you know, two different arms uh, from Delanco. Yes, I would definitely. And that would be uh, for your, basically your contribution for new subscribers. And that's, that's a one time only for this initial group of, of plank holders for the, uh, the solar farm, correct? Anyone who signs up through the Delango URL, yes. And okay. and uh, as as Kate alluded to, you don't even have to live in Delanco to do this. So if you have relatives that live in Beverly or you know any Cinnamon or anywhere, and or friends or family, you can send them the URL and they can sign up, and we will make a donation on their behalf. Um, and honestly, I mean, it, it depends on how you wanted to do it. If you wanted us to send the donation directly to Delanco, you know, to the township of Delanco, then you can you can split it up as many different ways as you want. But if you want us to make the donation directly to um, an organization, um, then you know, I would just ask to keep it to two different organizations. But that's. That's up to you. We would just, we would have that on the landing page, that information on the landing page. So we really wouldn't want it to be too, um, too overloaded with information because then that could just get. So are you going to have an advertising campaign or direct mailing 
following this to, to, to fill this or are you depending on word of mouth or what, what, what are you hoping for out of this? That's a good question. So we're kind of hoping that we can work with, with you, with Delanco, um, and perhaps, uh, you know, an email blast out to your residents if, you know, or a newsletter, you know, something in the newsletter, if you have something. Um, we have done, like I said, we have done the direct mail and it hasn't direct mail much to my chagrin and Zach since we both used to work in direct mail houses. <laughs> I try the Beverly B actually. You know, yeah. I contacted the Beverly B. Um, somebody else told me about the Beverly B and I can't remember, it was a long time ago and now I can't remember why we weren't able to do it. I will contact her again. Um, and we could, you know, we will, we would be more than happy to run something in the Beverly B. Um, and, and we will do that. Right. But if we could have Delanco support also, uh, if you're able to do that, we would be incredibly appreciative. Of, okay. Of All right. Yeah. We've even had in Illinois, for example, Solt has had some townships that have teamed up on the direct mail so that it kind of has that the township logo on it and so forth. It's really whatever level you're comfortable with. So, mm -hmm. you know, we don't want to, you can think about it and let us know, but an email blast, a newsletter, mm -hmm. um, all, all of the above would be really great. All right. Okay. Mayor, um, if, I, uh, if I could ask Randy, um, would you be able to send the PowerPoint presentation to my email? I sure. So I can have it on uh, for the record, please. Yep, I'll do that. Rather than just embedded in this um, recording. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. So much. And if I may ask a question, just for my own information, maybe I missed something. What is the billing at, that you? What are you billing people who sign up for? Less than ten percent. So we're billing for the energy that your solar share is generating. So, um, so because you're getting the credits from PSENG for the energy that you're that you're supplying. You, you're still charged for that energy, um, but at a discount. It's so pretty it's, similar to when you have solar on your roof, really, where it's the determined when you have it on your roof, it's called net metering. And it's a pretty similar mechanism. Has there ever been a, situ a circumstance where what you're billing and a PSE&G bill are more than the PSE&G bill, of course, less, less the gas. No, because, well, so every kilowatt hour that PSE&G credits you for, you know, in other words, they give you a negative charge, you know, we're going to, the we're going to charge you 90% of the value of that credit. So that's what's so great about this program. There's no like uncertainty that, that, you know, I think as Bill mentioned in the past, maybe there's been some offerings that you sign up and then it turns out to not save you money. Every kilowatt hour in this one is totally accounted for. And it makes it easy for us as the owner and operator to guarantee. Would um, at any point, since this is a community solar project, would uh, members be billed for special assessments, repairs, um, anything, uh, anything like that? Good question. I'm proud to say no, nothing like that at all. Uh, not ever. I mean, not has there, but Never. is there a potential, a potential for that? No, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, oh, there's just close, one other close. question that I see uh, from Liz Madisette uh, is so any PSENG resident residential customer in New who's, Jersey, who's no matter what county. It's Is from the there? chat, Mayor. Oh. Yeah, from the chat. Um, so no, for this particular project for the Tri County Solar Farm in Delanco, that serves PSENG residents in Burlington County, Camden County, and Mercer County. All right, uh, let's uh, we'll close this, and uh, the committee will will talk about this a little bit later and uh, see what direction or what we want to do to to um, get the word out if that's if that's the right thing to do. So.
Thank, thank you for you so your time. Much. Thanks for coming. Thanks for your patience. Thank you. And, thank you. Uh, it's been thank a pleasure. You. Thanks right. so much. Bye. Bye. Good night. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's see where are we? Can we use oh, we did that public comment statement? Uh, purpose of the public comment session is to allow residents to share information and their views with the Delenco Township Committee. Since the committee may be hearing the information for the first time, it's not always possible to have issues and questions settled within the public comment session. Uh, report of advanced remote meeting comments and questions. The section is to acknowledge and read those comments and questions received by the municipal clerk in advance of the remote meeting, either by electronic email or written letter as required, NJAC 5 colon 39 dash 1 at Sequeter. Uh, members of the public participating live in this meeting will be given the opportunity for comments and questions during the meeting in one or both of the public comment sessions. Meeting is now open to the public for comments and questions, session one. This is Laura, do you have any comments that have come in on for this session that don't relate to anything else? Now, for the record, Mayor, the only uh, pre-meeting uh, correspondence were the three um, cannabis uh, uh, emails. So, and I have nothing further. Uh, let's see, are there any comments and questions? I see I'm, Matt. Uh, I, Matt, you've used up your, your allocation of questions tonight. Go ahead, sir. Oh, I have no questions, so that's uh, good then. Uh, this, uh, Matt Barthold, 1800 second. Uh, just on behalf of DISA, just wanted to let everybody know our spring baseball, softball, and t-ball season has been in effect for the last three weeks or so. It's uh, very successful. All the kids are having a great time out there. Uh, also, we sent out our uh, fun drive letter in the mail uh, should have hit everybody's mailboxes last Tuesday or Wednesday that went out and we appreciate any contributions any residents uh, send in that's it thank you thanks any other questions or comments let me look at page two here yeah. and also residents um, are able to at this time when the meeting is open to the public put any comments in the chat um, function Right now, I don't see anything additional in the chat. All right, uh, comment question section of the meeting is now closed to the public. Comments and reports, uh, Township Administrator, Mr. Schwab. The only thing I have to report is that the 2021 budget information has been posted on the website, uh, the state forms, the spreadsheet, all the analysis of the budget, so that's there for everyone to look at, uh, the public hearing and potential adoption is scheduled for your May 17th meeting, seven o'clock on Zoom. Thank you so much. And thank you again, annually for the great work on the budget. And uh, it's it's good to be able to look into your office and the pile of paper on your desk is slightly smaller now, so. Slightly, right. slightly. Um, Mrs. Lord, do you have anything? Uh, I know it's not on the agenda, but anything to add? Mrs. Martin? No, last call for sign up for the townwide yard sale. So if you wanna participate, get that into us tomorrow. After that, we'll be uh, publishing the maps. You're out. Mrs. Martin, anything? No, sir, thank you. Thank you. Chief DeSanto. Yes, Mayor, uh, right before you go to the consent agenda, um, ordinance 2021-8, uh, I failed to uh, advise uh, the township solicitor, Mr. Heinhold, that uh, ordinance should include a time limit as well when we uh, do that parking ordinance. I'm recommending a 15 minute time limit. Mrs. Lohr, is that uh, pen and ink permissible? Yes, you haven't introduced it yet. So if you wanna make any uh, additional language, uh, any changes, this is the time to do it before we go to publication on it. Okay. So do no, you, want you, want, you want to pull that off consent? Yeah, we'll pull that off and address it just to get it, get it right or okay. get it how you want it. All right, anything else, Chief? No, that's all, Mayor, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Township Committee, uh, Mr. Brown is, uh, is recovering, uh, Mrs. Patrick. Okay, um, well, I think I've met with the history board at least three times since my last report. 
Uh, they're in the process of preparing the criteria for the historic designation program. And we are working on three properties to be designated this year. Um, 100B Russ Farm Way, uh, which is uh, the Newton Russ Farm Homestead. 519 Buttonwood Street, which was uh, Mr. Diggs' residence. And 725 Delaware Avenue, um, which uh, the builder was crossing. And it's the home of David Souter and Terry Mader. Uh, we have set up our list serves and we're working on a Facebook page yet. Um, well, I met with REC and EAB um, to determine the area. Liz was there, Mike was there, and uh, Phil McFadden to determine the area where the plants would be planted so EAB could use their grant at the new section of Gateway Park. I uh, met with the Field of Dreams meeting with a contractor. We went over the contract terms and necessary reports to be submitted to um, John Fenimore as noted in the contract. And I could see that we've already received some reports from uh, Brian from TLC. Uh, attended the OEM meeting. Terry explained the contents of the phone conferences that she has regarding COVID-19. Most of that information is regarding how they would submit reimbursement to FEMA. And we're lucky enough to have our township representative do that. I believe that's Beverly's job, Janice. Yes. Uh, a lot of towns have um, full-time coordinators for um, the Office of Emergency Management. So they do that. Uh, she did indicate that RCBC, the college is no longer a testing site as of May 15th, because they're reopening. So they won't be able to be tested, anyone. Uh, recreation is working to obtain a place for our, um, to provide rooms for the summer program. Uh, we're waiting to hear from the school and I've also uh, submitted a request to Dobbins. Uh, we distributed 114 Easter bags with eggs and dye kits for our children in town. Uh, DISA, as uh, Matt had indicated, uh, they had no opening day, but they are playing and they're having a great time. Uh, I did contact Dietz and Watson and they were generous enough to provide hot dogs for our concession stand. And uh, they are in need of volunteers to help work the concession stand. So if anyone has a free night and you'd like to volunteer some time, they certainly could use it. Um, I already reported that I did present Mrs. James with her um, proclamation for turning 100 on April 8th. Um, the Sewer Authority, um, the date of the memorial for Freddie Weller has been set for June the 6th at 11 o'clock and there'll be more details to follow on that. Uh, 989 Coopertown Road information uh, was requested from the sewer authority as well regarding connection fees. Uh, uh, and apparently um, Ben Weller had indicated it looks like it could be offices and more warehousing. Uh, Dolan is a work in progress for the sewer authority as well. They're waiting for connection fee and okay from Belanco Township. They did install signage at Bugs Ditch and they temporarily, let's see, still looking for temporary funding for the um, professional fees for the uh, sewer line sleeving project. And uh, I did connect um, Zach with uh, Tom Finan and he did report that, that in the solar farm is not available to the sewage authority, but they're looking at other areas. And they contacted me March 18th, and I've been back and forth with Zach and was able to get them on our agenda tonight. So I'm very thankful for that. And that's all I have. Thank you. Ms. Holland, thank you. Thanks, Kate. Um, nothing pressing to report. Just wanted to thank um, everyone who participated in the library 5K. Um, we have a, a great turnout. Um, raised about $1,200 um, thanks to very generous donations from a couple of the organizations in town, namely uh, Lou's Deli, 7-Eleven, the Ice Cream Bar, and Vinny's. Um, and hopefully we'll be making that an annual thing. Um, otherwise, 
attended the OEM meeting, but nothing additional to report. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Olette, how was your Yes, can you hear me? <laughs> All right, the phone works. Uh, question uh, for Ms. Fitzpatrick. Uh, the Memorial Day Parade, did we get any guidance from the uh, health department or from the state? Uh, Phil reported at our last meeting that he had uh, had a call in to um, Herb Conaway, but hadn't received anything. We're moving forward as um, uh, as we planned until we hear otherwise. Um, we've sent letters out, and we're also moving forward with the concerts. But I don't know if Phil is still online. I don't. Yeah, I think he is. He is there, Kate. Um... Yeah, Phil. Um, I don't know if you ever heard from Mr. Conway regarding the parade. Give him a minute to unmute. There he is. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, I did not hear back from Mr. Herb Conway or his office. Uh, I, however, I did email the governor's office and I got a response from Eugene saying that it is being a very popular question from multiple towns. And as soon as he gets any update, he would advise us. Okay. All right. Thanks, Bill. Uh, the, uh, as far as reports, the school board, uh, they introduced their budget, and that's on the school website. You also can get uh, to the school, uh, to their website through the township uh, website. Uh, go to community, hit schools, and then uh, hit the, I think it's K through eight, eighth grade, uh, and that'll bring up their website and get all the budget information for the school there. Uh, they're still concerned about the, uh, I think they said 5.2 positions that they're, they may have to cut uh, to meet their budget. Uh, they need to move forward. Uh, with the budget the way it is, uh, even though they're anticipating money from uh, the federal government from the COVID, uh, they can't count on it. They have to uh, continue to move forward. Uh, there was a suggestion uh, that the board is considering uh, going to uh, two monthly meetings for the school board, uh, which to me sounded like a great idea as opposed to them having uh, subcommittees and uh, this way here, all the members of the school board uh, would be involved, uh, be able to participate in the decision-making and they would know more uh, or have firsthand knowledge uh, on what's going on within the school board itself, as opposed to uh, getting to this, the one month meeting and just voting on things, but not having the full background uh, but it's a discussion that they're going to have amongst themselves uh, and uh, see if it makes sense to go to two school board meetings a month versus having all the, uh, I guess, the subcommittees doing their part. Uh, as far as the Joint Lane Use Board, uh, the fence ordinance was, again, uh, part of the discussion. And uh, the offer was made by Ms. Uh, Mrs. Taylor that uh, if our professionals or our uh, zoning officers or construction or anyone within town hall has questions about certain ordinances, uh, and I guess dealing with the fences, uh, anything in particular that they don't understand, uh, that she's available uh, for a phone call and uh, would be more than happy to help out and guide our, our folks uh, with our ordinances. Uh, there's also uh, a request made for uh, with the multifamily uh, housing uh, as far as uh, we as a committee taking a look at this uh, where we save, I guess, money for our residents. Uh, they asked if we could move that up on our agenda. I had 
said that we probably wouldn't be able to get it to it till July or August because of uh, the things that we're doing with uh, our budget and with the cannabis. Uh, but they were looking to see if we could do that sooner. I'm not sure we can, but uh, the request was made. And let's see what else we have. And that's about it for right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, County Health had a conference call, um, I believe it was last Thursday. And uh, one of the things uh, that uh, was mentioned and not a lot of detail was uh, County Health is seeing uh, um, uh, or feels that a lot of these, uh, the COVID uh, infections or the, the hotspots that are pop popping up are at, uh, generated at uh, youth sports activities, either school or uh, municipal recreation associations or, or leagues or things like that. And what the county uh, is trying to put together uh, uh, is a program to have pop-up testing clinics show up at uh, municipal uh, youth sporting events and do on-site testing there. Um, that's still in the works. Uh, uh, I just got an email or it had had posed a question, a follow-up question to County Health uh, late this afternoon and uh, got a reply that they're collecting emails and point of contacts for various things. So I'll send that on to, to Aaron and uh, uh, with the uh, County Health Department point of contact uh, for recreation and DISA and so forth and anybody else uh, uh, that they can get a hold of and say, you know, uh, and, and put out what, what the, what uh, what their program really is because uh, it has not been established yet. It's nothing on paper right now, but that's that's the county health department's plan. Regarding Memorial Day Parade, um, gauging how things have gone in the past uh, uh, on closures and openings and so forth, I, I don't think we're going to get a definitive yes you can or no you can out of out of the county and probably even Trenton. And I think think that's going to become a local call. Um, uh, our countywide, uh, Burlington County is still a, a hotspot. Uh, New Jersey is still a hotspot. Uh, whether that'll subside enough in the next uh, month or so uh, is unknown. Uh, we're running at the same infection rate that we saw a year ago, April. So um, I think uh, at this point and looking at those numbers, uh, I, th I think a traditional Memorial Day parade is uh, somewhat of a risky and uh, uh, fraught uh, endeavor. And we may really want to consider uh, something very low key like we did uh, last year uh, for Memorial Day. So um, any information that comes through from County Health uh, or, the, or Trenton, I'll certainly uh, distribute it and pass along. But uh, as I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wait for you know, a definitive yes or no. Um, then we're working on the flood ordinances. I've been filling in the blanks in the in the uh, in the model ordinances, and I've got a phone call into uh, DEP flood uh, just to verify a couple of couple of things that, that I have some questions about, and hopefully I can get something useful to Mr. Schwab and Mr. Fox, uh, and they can uh, fact check my uh, my amateur work. Uh, on the, on the two flood ordinances and hopefully save them some time. Uh, I did have a conversation with the uh, Burlington County School Superintendent last week. Uh, he returned a, a call that I made a couple days prior. Had a very nice conversation uh, with uh, Dr. Minnie, uh, Minini and uh, uh, confirmed a lot of the things that uh, uh, about school budgets and how things work and how things that don't work regarding funding and uh, uh, the ability of schools to adapt to changing conditions and uh, special education costs and so forth. Uh, I followed that up with an email to uh, uh, Senator Singleton's office and uh, got a reply this afternoon that was uh, piggybacked on an email from uh, uh, Congressman Kim's office. Um, and Senator Singleton is uh, very aware of uh, the distress, the financial distress our district is under uh, uh, among many districts, according to the county superintendent, we're all facing uh, uh, financial difficulties uh, 
uh, coming out of the COVID year and so forth. Um, but uh, uh, I encouraged uh, or suggested to Senator Singleton that uh, some kind of regional approach to uh, uh, shared services regarding special education and uh, something that can uh, help uh, K through eight districts in particular that are uh, those uh, funding needs are particularly acute. Um, one of the items that came back from uh, Congressman Kim's office this afternoon was that the American Rescue Plan, this is a quote from, from the email, the American Rescue Plan that Congress passed back in what uh, January, February, allows these funds to be used to retain school employees. Um, now, how fast that's coming down the pike, uh, that's the, uh, no pun intended, the $60,000 question. So, or $64,000, I think that was the show. Anyway, uh, that's, that's what everyone's uh, wondering about, how fast it's coming down out of, uh, out of Trenton, out of the Department of Education and so forth. But the uh, legislation that Congress passed specifically allows the, those, those funds to be used to retain school employees. So um, that seems to be, imply a, some good news there. And uh, I think that's the end of my report there. Consent agenda items. Uh, consent agenda items, agenda items are considered to be routine, will be enacted with a single motion. Any item requiring discussion will be re removed from the consent agenda. All consent agenda items will be reflected in full in the minutes. I believe we'll set aside ordinance 2021-8 for an edit. Uh, are there any other items on the consent or questions that would uh, to be considered separately or questions? Hearing none, we'll start off with ordinance 2021-9, um, amending chapter 292 governing vehicles and parking. This is first reading by title only set public hearing date for May 17th, 2021, 7 p.m. This is, uh, relates to a section of Emory Way. Resolution 2021-64, authorizing temporary use and occupancy agreement with R.E. Pearson Construction Company, incorporated under a current contract with the County of Burlington for use of 200 Ash Street. Resolution-65, resolution supporting um, S3522, creating local part of the Public Employees Retirement System, PERS. Payment of bills account, current fund, $21,223.45. Payroll, $42,754.76. Escrow trust, $2,612.25. Municipal open space, $1,050 even. Approval of department reports, approval of 2019-2020 uh, annual report of variances. Approval of the consent agenda, please. Motion. So moved. Second. I think that was Mr. Arlette. Second. No second. Chris Holland got the second. Roll call, please. Mr. Brown is absent. Ms. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Ms. Holland? Yes. Mr. Olette? Yes. Oh, I heard you. Come through. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Mr. Templeton? Yes. All right, uh, let's see. Ordinance 2021-8, amending chapter 292, governing vehicles and parking. Uh, this is relating to the parking area created in front of the bakery on Burlington Avenue and the edit to insert. What kind of language would be appropriate, Mrs. Lohr? Time well, actually, of... um, Chief, I believe the Chief said a 15-minute parking. Right. The, um, is that what you wanted, Chief? 15 that's minutes? That's my recommendation, yeah. 15, okay. I think 15 minutes is appropriate. Okay. So that's creating that for the area that's going to be allowed to have parking now. So what we have to do is amend section 295-7, schedule four, which um, is actually uh, sets time limits. So uh, we'll have to put, I'll have to put language in there, uh, but I have to work out because the amending schedule, uh, schedule one, 295-32 says now that there's no parking now from that part of Willow and from uh, Union but now we have to create a time limit in where we now have parking. So that language is gonna be a little bit different. 
but I'll work with Doug on that and we'll get that language in there so that where we're now where you're now allowing parking uh, also sets a time limit in in that uh, foot it as amount of footage between those two driveways it, 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 what's not easy about it usually when you look at that schedule four it's usually street to street but here we're talking distances from yeah. other intersections so it's a little bit more complicated but we'll get there I'll, I'll work with Doug and the chief on the exact footage that um, for the time limit and that would be amending uh, section 295-7 time limits schedule four all right that'll be so added for, in. for ordinance eight um, are you saying set this aside and come back when that one matches it and do them together no no I think um, we would just um, add the language in here, which will establish a time limit. And, and I did, um, if you look at the, in your packet, the second page, I did mark out where between the two driveways in front of the um, new business pied out, where parking will be allowed. Right. That, that area will be where the time limit will be. Because parking, right now, there's no parking there. This ordinance allows parking in this area, but we also but we're going to put language in it that also creates a time limit there. That's that's the only thing we need to add is the time limit, and that's is section 295-7 time limits. Yeah. But I mean, you're gonna you're gonna note the time limit in this particular ordinance for this area. You're gonna note it in here as well. Yes, there'll be another where it says in the ordinance um that's in your packet it says um it has 295-32 schedule one yeah. no parking fine that that stays as is but right. there'll be also a different additional language 295-7 uh, schedule um time limit schedule four is amended and the language that will be inserted there will be so that the area that does net that now allows parking um, has a time limit because if you if you adopt this right now as is it creates the no it creates parking in between those two driveways in front of the pied out but it creates no time limit so somebody could effectively park their car there um well, okay. and, and not move it but, right. but the area is def is defined the area of illegal parking is defined by subtraction correct yes. Actually, I was doing some here. Parking. So it's like it's like 159 feet running from yeah. to 1043 of 403 feet. So right. We'll have the time limit. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we say from, from a point 159 feet westbound, it, parking is limited to 15 minutes. Yeah, to 403 feet running east from intersection is limited it's 15 minutes and the way if you, look, if you were to look at the schedule in the code it, it will say um limited to 15 minutes yeah. we have other we have other areas in town that have similar type language right. um the only difference is that it usually says a designated parking area okay. lot to, or between two streets that's okay. what makes us a little this. Bit more complicated do i need to spell out what this is going to say and get this moving along or no, it's just take it and and you'll you'll do the proper verbiage with the chief and figure it out. I think for this ordinance, it's just uh, um, adding uh, section two ninety five dash seven time limits schedule four, um, creating the fifteen minute time limit um, within the newly created uh, allowable parking area. Right. Chief, unless you have any, anything else. Yeah. I think you try to explain the best you, you could. It, you know, this ordinance allows the parking. The next ordinance we're going to have limits when that parking can be. And the only well, the only thing we need the county to be involved with is allowing us to open it up for parking. Right. So we can, if we can pass this ordinance or introduce this ordinance and start that process, uh, we can get this to the county. Well, do you, yes, well, do you want the, well, this, I was talking about putting this additional language in this ordinance, not two separate ordinance. Right. This ordinance would also have an, um, include section 295-7, um, adding the time limit to the- I the misunderstood. I thought you 
you were saying that in dash 295.7, we have to change that language. You do. Okay. Yeah. But is you that to... another ordinance change? Well, we either add it to this ordinance or we create later on another ordinance. It doesn't really matter. All right. Well, add it to this ordinance then since we we'll had it here. Yeah. I, I think okay. I just confused myself. So yeah. So so can we do a motion then to approve this with the necessary changes? And when it's up for public hearing, we'll have that clean copy with the changes. Yes. Yeah, as a matter of fact, what's going to get posted on the bulletin board and on the website for the public hearing will be the ordinance adding that section 295-7 right. with the time limit. Okay. That area that will have the time limit. Okay. All right. For ordinance 2021-8 amending chapter 292 governing vehicles and parking uh, with the amended provision of 15 minute limitation and referencing uh, chapter 295-7 for 15 minutes. Does that cover it? Yes. Yes. And we'll also um, uh, set your public hearing date for May 17th, 2021 at 7 p.m. I was getting there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, motion please. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, Second. Uh, roll call. Okay, let me get a roll call. Mr. Brown is absent. Ms. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Ms. Holland? Yes. Mr. Olette? Yes. And Mr. Templeton? Thank you. Yes. Uh, I think that cleans up the consent agenda. Meetings are now open to the public for comments and questions. Session two. Any questions or comments from the public, please? Mr. Tarashi, anything? Okay. All right. Session two, uh, question and comment section of the meeting is now closed to the public. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Mayor? Oh, Dan? Dan? That I have my hand smart. raised. Yes? I did have my hand raised. I was trying to be silent. Uh, something uh, happened this morning that I think is getting more and more uh, exasperating in our township. Uh, the truck parking on Enterprise Avenue, it extended so far towards Cooperstown Road, the truck could not make the right-hand turn and was blocking traffic. Uh, seems like they're parking vehicles closer and closer to Cooperstown Road. And it's, I'm thinking as a planning board member, when they come in for anything else, something has to be done because that's a safety hazard. It was backing up about four vehicles going into our town. Well, something has been done. Uh, we passed the ordinance. I'm just waiting for Public Works to put up the signs so the uh, area can be enforced. I've already spoke to the, the uh, I'll speak to them again, but I spoke to the, uh, I believe it was on Wednesday, I spoke to what they call the trail jockey, the supervisor of the trail jockey, and I advised them that uh, those signs are gonna be posted it's going to get started to be enforced. So he needs to come up with a plan where to place those trailers that are currently on the township right away. And keep in mind the township right away only runs to approximately the entrance to, um, to Misfits. It does not yeah. run entirely into that. But that would allow truck movement, which is what I'm concerned about, off of Cooperstown. Yes, that's why we passed the ordinance to address that. Okay. Yeah. Parking is prohibited on both sides. Uh, and that was uh, a lot of work by Chief DeSanto and meeting with all the principals out there. Uh, what, last January, right? February? Yeah, I think that's when we started, yes. Yeah. So. Thank you. Uh, any correspondence, Mrs. Lord? None. No okay. further. Uh, do we need an executive session for anything? Seeing or hearing none. No. I see Richard's giving a, a his. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well done. Good meeting, everybody. Um, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. All in favor. All Aye. in favor. Aye. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody.
Night, Aaron. Thank you. You're welcome.